My name is Dale Solomon. I can't say I'm ashamed or proud of everything I've done. Sometimes life itself forces you to make difficult decisions. I grew up loving but pretty cramped in the means of the family. I have two older sisters and two younger brothers. I am that middle child in age. Since money was tight for us, I worked starting in my teens. Despite the fact that many people told me that I was a very smart boy, most of the work that fell to me was rough and hard, but it brought me money for necessary expenses. When I was in school, I sometimes had to donate blood and biological samples to make ends meet and pay my daily expenses. I met Celeste, and we were together after six weeks of dating. I worked 32 hours a week, which was just enough to earn extra benefits. Although it cost me almost all of my free time, I also took 14 credit hours in evening courses. Celeste worked in the office of one of the insurance offices. Even when we added up our two incomes, tuition and living expenses did not allow us to accumulate any savings. The only way to survive was to keep your eyes on the horizon slipping away in the distance, waiting for some chance thrown by luck. When the lack of money began to seem like a truly insurmountable obstacle, I, or rather we, decided that a short service in the army would do me good. The benefits mentioned in the Guy Bill seemed like the best long-term solution. A month after I started boot camp, Celeste told me she was pregnant. She also said that her parents agreed to help with the child when the appropriate time came. I was young and stupid. Yes, I know this is not an acceptable excuse. But then I was so devastated that it didn't even occur to me to check. We had been married for two years when Celeste gave birth to our son. If it had been a girl, she would have been named Gloria. Since it was a boy, we agreed on the name Darrell Thomas in advance. And, less than a month after giving birth, I was served with divorce papers. At that time I was still in the service, far from my home. In the petition for divorce, Celeste did not demand from me either alimony or money for child support. Attached to her application was a copy of my birth certificate, which stated in black and white that I no longer had a son named Darrell Thomas Solomon. Instead, the document identified Celeste's co-worker, Wendell, as the child's father Trout. That's how Darrell Thomas disappeared, and the child's name was Wendell instead Trout Jr. The petition did not stipulate any conditions for the visit, since formally I was no longer the boy's father. My comrades convinced me that losing such a wife was the best possible outcome for me. It was difficult to object to this. However, try telling that to my broken heart. Since the day I was served with the divorce papers, I have never spoken to Celeste. Don't get me wrong, it took me a long time to regain my confidence and trust in women. But in the end, I succeeded. I found a woman who truly loves me, and even despite this, we achieved almost nothing. I met Dee at one of the neighborhood barbecues. She was the sister of one of my neighbors, whom I didn't know very well at the time. Although she had been to a few of these parties before, we had never spent much time together. That evening I was too, in a shell, still worried about the consequences of the divorce, to take the first step. Dee sensed my stiffness and broke the ice by talking to me. I heard you wore a military uniform, she asked, casually starting a conversation. Yes, ma'am. And you? No, I'm a completely civilian person, she smiled. How long have you been back? About nine months. Are you here alone today? I asked just in case. And not only today, what about you? Imperceptibly and easily, she switched to a more informal style of communication. Yes, free and carefree, I grinned, adapting to her communication style and feeling as if this woman and I had known each other for a long time. I'm just trying to be sociable. What house do you live in? Oh, I don't live next door. My sister invited me here. There she is, she said, pointing to the woman, talking with someone on the side who was not at all like her. Well then, what brings you here? You, she answered briefly and simply, with a Mona Lisa smile and some twinkle in her eyes. Well, yes, of course. Although I've already seen you at several such gatherings, I reassured her. Oh, I see, you think you're the only one who's allowed to be shy. Well, nameless lady, how do you feel about getting out of here, 
eating some ice cream and going to the movies. By the way, my name is Dale, I introduced myself, putting forward a business-like and quite cultural proposal, which under certain conditions could have an interesting continuation for both of us. I would love that, Dale. How about you call me D? And so we charted and together charted a course that led us to moving in together eight months later. D was studying and preparing to take the exam soon to become a lawyer. After receiving my bachelor's degree, I got a management position in a distribution center. We rented a house in an ordinary residential area. From time to time, we would take a vacation and go to Las Vegas for the weekend. Life together seemed quite pleasant and good, although neither of us talked about marriage. I must admit, I didn't pay enough attention to what happened soon. Having accepted an invitation to yet another neighbor's party, I wandered around the backyard. D couldn't take the day off this time, so I ended up there alone. The only thing, or rather, who I really should have avoided was our neighbor, who was an approachable woman. Her name was Bevan. She was a flirt who loved to flirt and openly tried to interest me, which led Tosses into a rage. I don't care what you do, but God forbid I hear that you spent even five seconds alone with Bevan. Is that clear, mister? She reprimanded me, angrily sparkling her eyes and poking her finger at my chest. Yes, sir. Or ma'am. Or dear. That's right, I understand. I saluted her. Well, I was a master at avoiding Bevan at this party. A couple of newcomers to our community who organized this entertainment for the neighbors Randy and Harley were dressed quite boldly that evening. In Harley's case, this was clearly noticeable. She behaved quite relaxed. At the same time, Randy seemed completely unfazed by his wife's provocative behavior. After some time had passed, the party seemed to be ending, as several of the men in the backyard were no longer visible. I decided that I had spent enough time to satisfy the requirements for a polite visitor accepted at such events. Randy was just directing one of the remaining guys into the house when I tapped him on the shoulder to say goodbye. He turned around. Are you sure you want to leave yet, Dale? Things get pretty exciting down there in the bedroom. If you know what I mean, he grinned and winked at me knowingly. Yes, I am sure. Welcome to our area. Say hi to Harley. I replied. Well, well. Then come on, follow me through the house. You can go out the front door. I followed Randy. We walked quite close to the half-open door. Something interesting was clearly happening there. I just smiled and continued walking towards the exit of the house. If only I had known where this was going, I could have been better prepared for the storm of shit that would hit me later that evening. You pathetic bastard. How could you? There was a cry from the enraged D who exploded into the house like a whirlwind. How could I? Cheating with our new neighbor. Bevan said that every man who was at their party did it. Not true. I avoided Bevan at all costs and didn't see Harley again after the first hour or so. Although I heard it when I left. Ask Randy, I had no part in any of this. Bevan said something completely different. Briefly speaking, Take your shit and go to the guest bedroom. You won't sleep with me tonight, okay? She raged. That evening was the beginning of the end. After that, everything never returned to normal. After two months of living in the same shared house, but alone, I warned Dee that things had better get better, otherwise I would move out. Looking back, I can say that if we were ultimately heading towards a breakup, then at that moment it was the right time for this. Before that, we had already discussed the possibility of getting married and starting a real family several times, but we never moved beyond conversations. Moreover, the absence of children drew a line under our relationship. The only thing that truly shocked me was how quickly Dee's love turned into hatred based solely on the words of the person she said she always despised. If Dee was such a mentally unstable person, then perhaps I should have thanked my lucky stars that we broke up when we did. Although, try to say this to my heart, which is aching from unfulfilled hopes. In the end, I found another apartment and moved out. Somehow, I wasn't at all shocked when Bevan left a message on my cell phone shortly after, asking if I wanted to meet her. I never called her back. It's just that there wasn't enough of her in my life. 
I had been alone for almost a year when my heart received an unwanted jolt. Over the years, I still haven't gotten around to deleting Dee's contact information from my cell phone. So when it buzzed one Saturday night and Dee's number flashed on the screen, I didn't know what to do. My stomach suddenly tightened, my heart raced faster, and my palms began to sweat. What the hell did she want? The easiest way was to send a message, and after long, unsuccessful trills, the phone fell silent for a while and then briefly rang, notifying me of his arrival. Hey, Dale. I was wondering if you'd like to meet up sometime. I owe you an apology, and I'd like to do it in person. I read a text message from D. Damn it. I ended things with her and tried to move on with my life. Why should I now give her the opportunity to clear her conscience? Yes, I still had strong feelings for her, but with some sixth sense I knew that it was better not to renew this relationship. So I answered. Thanks, no which prompted the immediate question. Why? I could say, because I hate you. I could say, you're not worth my time. I could also write, because you are crazy. Instead of all this, I didn't answer her. I woke up on Sunday morning to find a series of new text messages from D. Since I didn't want to meet with her, she was apparently going to put everything she knew and wanted to tell me in a bunch of text messages so they poured into my phone one after another. Apparently Randy and Harley filmed their games, as well as what they offered. Somebody's divorce lawyer got wind of it and filed a lawsuit. An analysis of the video presented in court in this case detailed who was involved in the act. As I emphasized on that fateful day, I was not one of the characters in their party. Wow, now she believed me and regretted what she had said and done. Although I haven't kept an eye on her since our breakup, I decided to give Dee a taste of her own bitter medicine. I wrote, It doesn't matter now. From what I hear, after I left, you became one of the most easily accessible ones in the area. I know I could never live with a woman of her behavior. Have a happy life, Dee. Almost instantly, the phone rang. Dale, that's not true. Who did you hear that from? That's not who I am. Let her be angry, maybe it will be good for her. I didn't answer. Unsurprisingly, my phone started ringing within minutes, and I finally turned it off. Let's talk about how to touch a nerve. Maybe I should have kept statistics. After my remark about her frivolity, a barrage of several dozen SMS and voice messages fell on my cell phone, of course. All of them remained unanswered. She desperately wanted to protect her reputation. How could I allow even a tiny thought that this was true? The flow of messages and calls stopped only after two weeks. Glory to the eggs. The last one sounded like this. I'm so sorry. I understood everything. I made a wild accusation that you couldn't defend. I finally realized that you did the same thing to me. I threw out a good man, and now I regret it. I'll leave you alone. But I still love you. D. A week later, I decided to meet D for a drink or two. Why? It was difficult for me to explain this even to myself. Perhaps her last text message gradually melted my previous resolve not to communicate with her anymore. Part of me screamed, run. But the main idiot assured me that he had everything under control. D came to our meeting fully armed. While we were together, she always dressed quite conservatively but today her appearance was special. Dale, my eyes are up here, she said with a grin on her face. And they are very beautiful too, D. I answered with difficulty tearing my gaze away and raising my eyes upward. You went out of your way to make me admire you, so it would be impolite for me to ignore you. How are you doing? Full of optimism. And you? It's too early to say, what should I order you to drink? White wine. That hasn't changed. Don't you think this skirt is too short? She asked as if by chance. It might not be suitable for a church, but it's just right for a bar like this. Do you come here often? I asked. For the first time. I was hoping to find someone like you. What about you? You're probably a regular here. Yeah, this is my favorite place to pick up girls. Usually there is a large selection of them here, I said in a rather casual tone. This made D shudder involuntarily. However, I noticed it and grinned back. 
I have some reason to believe that you are one of the guys who are loyal to the extreme, she said with some sadness in her voice. Therefore, I think it would not be amiss to ask, will I interfere with your current girlfriend? Did I mention that part of my inner self was saying, run, after our breakup, I admit that I briefly enjoyed a few casual one-night stands, and I was in no way ready for another long-term relationship, especially with D. Now I have decided that honesty is the best policy. No, at the moment my heart doesn't trust any woman. It may be months or even years before I have the courage to put myself through that kind of pain again. At these words, Dee's eyes clouded with sadness. I'm so sorry, Dale. Can I interest you in a friends with benefits offer so you don't forget about me? She probably understood that I was in her hands. I shifted uncomfortably in my chair. First I need to buy protective equipment, I muttered. She shuddered again and began. But you, you don't need. And then, shaking his head, okay, okay, at your place or at my place, she asked, lowering her voice and breathily, leaning across the table towards me. Let's go with you. This way I can leave when I need to. D, I know what you want, for us to be together again. I'm really sorry. What we had before no longer suits me. I once admitted to her. Perhaps I need help to understand why I have become so emotionally distant. And I don't want to mislead you. Your attitude is wonderful, but I just can't find the love I had before again. Dale, I noticed that, she answered with a sigh. You are no longer the person I knew before. I'm ready to give you more time to find yourself. I still blame myself for doing this to you. I stopped calling her, but Dee didn't. She never ceased to keep me updated on the events of her life. Even though I refused, she continued to periodically invite me to stay at her place for the night. The problem was that it wasn't just Dee that I wasn't interested in. I came to terms with the fact that I needed professional help to overcome the depression that had taken over me. Dave, my counseling psychologist, had some good success and convinced me to invite Dee to join us for a few sessions. During them, he was not politely gentle with her, persistently getting to the very essence of the problems and contradictions that existed between us. The realization that Dee had never truly trusted me made her return home in tears. As a result, she took it one step further and began conducting her own private consultations. Gradually, in small steps, we resumed our friends with benefits meetings and I began to think that over time we might work our way up to being in a serious relationship again. I had been divorced from Celeste for five years when one day she suddenly left a message for me at my parents' house. I waited a few days before calling her back. I had absolutely no reason to talk to her again, but natural curiosity took over. Celeste, this is Dale. You called me. Thank you for calling, the half-forgotten but so familiar voice of his ex-wife came through the receiver. Wendell and I need to talk to you about something very important, and we were wondering if we could meet. We could treat you to dinner, if you want. I agreed to a meeting in a cafe located near the house where I live. Dee decided to join me. Celeste was accompanied by a man whom she introduced as her husband, Wendell. She was dressed quite stylishly, looked good, and was quite sociable. After the waitress took our orders and left, Celeste looked at each other with her husband, as if gathering determination for the test, after which she took out an envelope and placed it on the table in front of her. Dale, I have one confession to make, and then I have a favor to ask of you. When I gave birth to the baby, well, you and I were still married then. Anyway, I named Wendell his father, but, ah, uh, well, I... We recently discovered that this is not the case. Anyway, Dale, his father is you. Dee squeezed my hand until it hurt. My heart started beating faster, and I felt my stomach tighten. Do you want to say anything about this? Celeste drawled slightly, frowning, carefully observing my reaction. What is your request? Having controlled myself, I muttered. Wendell Jewer needs a bone marrow donor, and I was hoping you would be willing to do it for him. I have here, she put her hand on top of an envelope lying on the table, I have a DNA test that shows that Wendell is not the boy's father. The only other person who could be his father is you. 
The DNA test and doctor's report on Wendell Juar are in this envelope. You will need to be tested to see if you are compatible, but since I am not a donor match, the doctors have said that you are almost certainly compatible with your own son. I passed my biological samples to the bank long before we met. I objected. I may have several, perhaps even dozens of children that I conceived but never met in my life. Why do you think that your child is more deserving of my time and a piece of my body than they are? Unlike others, he was conceived naturally. Doesn't that mean anything? She squeezed out. Not for me. Your child, in my opinion, is no different from any others I may have ever conceived. I have absolutely no emotional attachment to any of them. If this is what the lying woman gave birth to, then so be it. If that's all you've got, then it's time for me to get back to work. Please don't call my wife names, this ferret sitting opposite intervened. Celeste squeezed his hand. Don't pay him any attention, Wendell. If he wants to communicate that way, well. But we shouldn't stoop to his level. Looking at the ruffled window, I continued. Tell me, is she cheating on you the same way she cheats on me? Wendell, that's not true. Celeste was alarmed. I, I never cheated on him. I didn't have any lover. He's always lying. D laughed and began to mock Celeste. Oh, oh, I've never cheated. Wendy, it's not considered cheating with you. Celeste, with her face revealed by spots, was practically screaming. Fuck you, Dale. How can you turn your back on your son so coldly? I'll tell you what, I cut off her screams. I will find out if there is a way to check if anything is possible. But so far unknown to me, children are sick. If there is one and his mother does not turn out to be a deceitful woman, then I will help that child. How do you like this? I stood up from my seat, indicating that the conversation was over, lifted D to his feet and headed towards the door. Before we had time to take a few steps, Wendell spoke unlike Celeste in a conciliatory and pleading tone. Dale, we need your help. Talk to us. What is needed for this? Stopping and turning around, I presented my conditions. Correct my son's birth certificate to list me as his father and then change his name to Darl Thomas Solomon. If you do this, then I'll see if I'm compatible with him. Until that happens, don't even think about bothering me again. After that, D and I left, although they begged me to stay and talk to them. D wasn't sure how to break the ice. What are you thinking about, Dale? I think you are a much nicer and kinder woman than she is. Are you going to help the boy? His name is Darl. It seems you can't trust me completely, can you? I, I'm sorry. If I trust you, will you marry me? This matter could turn out to be unpleasant, you understand? I have asked you a question. I've been thinking about my life prospects for some time. Together, D and I made great progress in therapy, and I truly loved it. So what the hell? Yes, I will marry you if you help me with this matter, I finally answered, and her face lit up. Can you issue a new birth certificate and documents for a name change? Oh yes, I will be happy to help you. The next day I was busy with some work, but D delivered the already completed documents by courier. The instructions to Celeste and Wendell were to complete all the paperwork with the notary and then call us to set up the next appointment. The kit also included a DNA testing kit, so I could see if Doral was really my child. Another day passed before we met them again. It's nice that you joined us today. Did you bring the completed documents as agreed? D asked busily, acting very professional. Yes, everything is here in the envelope. And here's a DNA swab from when? I mean from Daro. Celeste quickly corrected herself, stuttering for a second. I immediately intervened. We will not submit these documents until all medical procedures are completed. By the way, I have a list of questions that you both will have to answer. We need to determine how medical expenses will be paid as far as I know, you also have a two-year-old daughter. Yes, Audrey celebrated her second birthday last month. When are you getting tested, Dale? As soon as my consultant tells me everything is okay. That evening, I gave D detailed instructions on how to prepare the documents. This contradicts my common sense, she told me with some doubt, says, but I trust you, Dale. For our sake, 
I hope that whatever you have in mind is not only legal, but also successful. Didn't I tell you how much I love you? Very soon you will love me as much as I love you. Oh, that's it, I'm daydreaming. You'll never catch up with me in this, mister, D laughed. Another day passed, and we all gathered around the negotiating table again. Thank you for joining us. Although I'm not too sure that I want to help you, I began the dialogue with a slight frown. Dale, please don't say such things, Celeste sobbed pleadingly. The boy really needs your help, because his condition has begun to deteriorate. Does Darrell like his sister Audrey? I asked a question that, apparently, they did not expect. Why, yes, she answered, sniffling. Does Audrey like her brother Darrell? Yes, but why? It would be a pity to separate them, I interrupted her question. If you want me to authorize a bone marrow transplant, then you must give me full custody of both children. In my opinion, it would be too difficult to separate brother and sister. Wendell and Celeste at the other end of the table turned into pillars of salt, their eyes rolling and their mouths open in shock. And I don't think it would be a good idea for you to have visitation rights for the next two years. Let them get used to their new parents first, I added. Wendell was the first to unfreeze, his face contorted, and jumping up from his seat, he shouted, What the heck? No way I will allow you to steal my daughter. Sorry, ferret, but you stole my child first. So what's the difference then? I shrugged. I didn't. I didn't steal it. Celeste told me that I was his father. This is a turn, isn't it? To think that the cheater lied to you, what a surprise. Tell me, did you know she was married when you started being with her? Wendell didn't answer, but pulled back, plopping back into his chair and looking somewhere to the side. Come on, you asshole, answer this fucking question. Why, yes, he squeezed out with difficulty. A hum, I see. Apparently, it's normal for you to steal someone else's wife. You have an excellent set of moral principles. Congratulations, you two are simply made for each other, bending lips in an ironic smile, I stated. Then he slammed his palm on the table. Okay, do you want me to help you? Then register the children both children. On me. D has already prepared all the documents for this. Celeste sniffled, barely holding back her sobs. Dale, how can you be so heartless? Look in the mirror, I snapped. In it, you will see how heartlessness itself looks back at you. Briefly speaking, I won't repeat it again. Bring the completed documents and bring the children when you are ready to continue the conversation. Wendell and Celeste were sobbing into each other's shoulders as D and I left the room. After this meeting, Dee was very quiet, and from time to time I caught the worried glances she cast at me. What she saw and heard during the negotiations greatly disturbed her. You know, Dale, this is a side of you that I never knew existed. It sounds like you have a lot of repressed anger inside of you, she told me. Dee was probably right. I felt that something was accumulating inside me and was looking for a way out. When I started speaking, my voice was not loud, but after just a few minutes, I was almost screaming. What makes you think that? I fell in love, then got married, and then served my country so that my family could have a better life. I did what a husband and head of the family was supposed to do. And what happened? Someone just took my heart and tore it out. You can understand how I felt then, right? Oh, wait a minute. No, die, you can't, because later, when I was with you, I acted with the same responsibility with which I should have acted. But was that enough for you? Nuuo, I'm treated like crap, and my heart is being mercilessly ripped out again. Now they tell me that I have a son who was stolen from me. Did something similar happen in your life, too? I don't think so. Maybe you're right. I'm overreacting. What am I thinking about now? Let me take a deep breath and stop being so childish. What I'm thinking is that maybe I was too hasty. Maybe it's not such a good idea for us to get married. I started to get up with the intention of leaving when Dee attacked me. She was as loud and boisterous in her speech as I was. Sit down now. You're not going anywhere. Like this. Look, I'm so sorry. I tried to make amends to you. I screwed up. I know it. You know it. And I didn't doubt you. I was just trying to get you to talk to me. I think I succeeded. 
Maybe now you can calm down a little. I hope so. Yes, you're right. Celeste gave you a big shit. And then I added my own crap. Sorry again for this. I agreed to trust you with this DNA matter, but you have an advantage over me. Honestly, I have no idea where this is all going to lead and what the hell are we going to do with two children, she exclaimed, clutching her head. So forgive me if I seem too worried to you, but until you let me in on your plans, I think I have the right to be nervous. We both had tears in our eyes by this point. I swallowed the lump in my throat and answered, Sorry, what you said. I admit it's true. Now take your pencil and notepad and let me tell you what I hope will happen soon. I made my next request to Dee. Hearing my plan, she immediately perked up. As I prepared for the new meeting, I really wasn't sure that Celeste and Wendell would capitulate after all. But only two days passed before the children were taken to Dee. I've never seen two adults cry so hard. D and I took the kids to the mall cafeteria and waited. About 15 minutes later, I was informed that Celeste had headed to the underground parking lot. We intercepted them there, already getting into the car, leading the children. Audrey ran on her short, hurried legs towards Celeste and Wendell, greeting them with joyful squeals as if they were long-lost friends. They were both completely confused, looking as if aged for ten years. What? Dale, I, I thought you didn't want us to see them for two years? Celeste asked me stammeringly, with red eyes and drooping shoulders, nevertheless, automatically hugging little Audrey to her. I never intended to file for guardianship. I wanted you to prove how much you love your children, I replied. The documents are drawn up in such a way that I can submit them to court at any time, right up to their 18th birthday. If I ever find out that these children have ever been treated roughly or cruelly, I will come to court to take them away from you, I promised sternly. But Dale, are you still going to get tested? She asked with a flash of hope. No, I took the test the day after our first meeting. I'm about as incompatible with Darl as it gets. My mismatched blood type immediately disqualified me from becoming a donor for the boy. This also proves that your son's father is not me. This is a surprise, right, Ferret? I threw towards Wendell, who froze at this news, like a deer jumping into the road in headlights. And as for you, Celeste, you really were a cheater all along, weren't you? Wendell looked shocked and completely confused. Celeste shouted, This can't be, so you are also a medical expert now? I mocked her ironically. I suggest you find his real father or hope like hell that someone suitable appears on the donor registry. Due to privacy laws, I never found out who saved Wendell Juar. All I know is that he spent 11 weeks in the hospital before he was allowed to go home with Celeste and figurehead dad Wendell. Dee stayed in touch with them because she wanted everything to have a happy ending. I kept my promise and proposed to Dee. We, well, mostly me, I still have some problems to solve. Dave, our personal consultant, conducted more than one session, helping me to overcome my problems with controlling anger. At the same time, he helps A's accept me as I am. D and I already have two girls. Celeste and Wendell tried a couple more times to have their own Wendell Jr. Alas, it didn't work out. More precisely, it worked out, but not the way they wanted. Wendell Jr. now has three sisters, there couldn't have been a better pair of twins. As for my supposed children, for whom I once sacrificed my biological samples, I have not yet been able to find any of them, if they exist at all. With all these DNA search sites out there, I think it's only a matter of time before they are discovered. If they ever need me, I'll do whatever it takes, but maybe without any fuss this time. D and I fed all the documents we got from Celeste to the paper shredder. And yes, I know I probably acted like a real ass, but I think I had every right to do so.